Hey everyone, this is Saitam and today I'll be teaching you how to create an X64 Silence Aimbot from scratch. A Silence Aimbot is just an aimbot that hits a target without moving your crosshair. And if you've been paying attention to the screen, this is exactly what I mean. We'll be reversing our button and figure out a way to exploit the game's logic to create a Silence Aimbot. Everything you need to follow this tutorial has already been taught in the previous chapters of the Game Hacking Bible. Let's get into it. So, in every game, there's this notion of a line that gets drawn from your player position to wherever you're looking. So right now, there is a ray coming from where I'm standing, to where I'm looking at. So my idea right now is what if we find a way to manipulate where this line starts and finishes. If we figure that out, we can make it so that the game thinks that our lines are being drawn from inside another player and end inside another player, right? So in other words, my bullets are gonna be spawning inside the enemy. And since they're inside the enemy, it's gonna be an instant collision. And that'll mean that there is no need for us to actually move our camera around. So with that said, let's actually start looking. So if I was developing this game, I'd probably put this ray tracing functionality inside or close to wherever I'm handling shooting the actual gun. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna find the shoot function and go from there. So how do we find the shoot function? Well, we can just look for the ammo, 19, first scan, shoot your gun, 18, next scan, and we get two values. One of these values is related to the server and the other one is related to the local player. Inside our button, there's this notion of an actual game, client, and an actual server. We aren't really interested in the server because the actual ray tracing probably happens from the actual client. So, which one of these is more likely to be the actual ammo value we're looking for? Well, one of them is 2878 and the other one is 2870. The actual local player pointer points to 2878. So it's probably going to be this one. Now we can do find what writes to this address and we can shoot our gun. This decrement instruction shows up and we can actually do show in disassembler and we can start looking. So we can see that we are in fact in this function called shoot. So our button ships with some symbols, which makes reversing the game super simple. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take this address and go back to IDA. But before that, we're going to have to rebase the actual program in IDA. Since our button has ASLR enabled, that means that every time you launch the program, it's going to be at a different location in memory. So you can go to tools, there's like PE headers and MZ start, take that address, go to IDA, go to edit, Segments, rebase program, 0x, paste that in. And now we can take this address and jump to this function. Decompile. And we can see that we are inside the shoot function. So I'm going to rename this to shoot. This video is sponsored by Malcor.io. As reverse engineers, we know how critical it is to thoroughly analyze files for potential threats and vulnerabilities. But traditional sandbox solutions can be frustratingly slow, taking several minutes to scan a single file. That's where Malcor comes in. Malcor is an advanced, next-generation sandbox solution built for speed and scale. While other leading tools can take several minutes to analyze a single file, Malcor delivers results in just seconds. Some of Malcor's standout features include advanced static and dynamic analysis, shellcode emulation to unpack obfuscated malware, similarity matching to identify related malware variants, fuzzy hashing or SSD for similarity analysis, dynamic Windows OS emulation, and many, many more. By emulating the target environment directly, Malcor can sandbox files without needing to spin up full virtual machines every time. This method enables Malcor to analyze malware with unparalleled speeds and capture low-level details other solutions simply miss. They also offer an extensive API that allows you to integrate Malcor into your existing security stack. This makes it easy to automate your analysis workflows and scale your security operations. Want to see Malcor in action? Sign up for a free trial over at malcor.io. So let's look around and see what we can find. So these dwords and keyword constants that you see here are actually named inside Cheat Engine. So what we can do is that we can sync the actual pseudocode with IDA view. So what we can do is that we can take the address of this if statement and go to Cheat Engine and jump to this address and see what we can find. So I can see that there's a comparison R12 instruction here. Take this address, I'm gonna have to find it. So that doesn't tell us anything, that's fine. It doesn't matter. This is what we're looking for. Take this address, go here, paste. And we can see that this points at a player one. So, which is actually our local player. So we can rename this to local player pointer or just local player. So 
immediately, this tells me that a1 is probably a player pointer. This function is probably reused for every single entity. So every entity is going to be passed into this function. So I'm going to rename a1 to entity. So just like that, we can actually rename this too. If you go back here, take this cheat engine, jump to its address. So that's last millisecond. So I'm going to rename this to last millisecond. I guess last millisecond copy. And this is actually last millisecond. Let's see what v3 is. So we are indexing into the entity at offset 1fc. Let's go to reclass. And this is our entity. And an offset 1fc. You can see that there's something. We don't quite know what it is. So it probably doesn't matter to us. So let's look around and see what else we can find. Immediately, this fsqrt function call jumps out to me because it seems to me like it's the distance 3d function. So we can see that something's being squared, another thing is being squared, and another thing is being squared, and they're all being added up. And then we take the square root of all of them. This is relevant because it's actually used in that ray tracing functionality. So let's see what v26 and v31 and all these values are. Let's start from right here. So v30 is at offset zero of our player. So this is the actual X position because this is the position and that's the X, Y, and Z. So we can actually rename this to X coordinate. V8 is just zero, that's fine. We can rename V9 to X chord copy. V31 is at offset four of the actual class, which means it's probably the Y coordinate. And V10 is making a copy of it. V32 is at offset 8 of the entity class. Again, it's probably just a Z coordinate. And V11 is the Z port copy. So if we get to this A2, that's not immediately clear of what it is. It might be view angles. It might be something, something to do with distance 3D. So we're going to have to do some dynamic analysis here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to figure out what A2 is by looking at it in Cheat Engine. So if you go back here, we can see that this is moving EAX into this address and EAX is actually getting its value from RDX. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to grab the address of RDX and paste it into reclass and see what we can find. So I'm going to take this address, go back to cheat engine, toggle this breakpoint on this address, and I'm going to go shoot my gun. So RDX is at address at this address, right? Go back to reclass, add a new class, paste it right here. And this immediately jumps out to me as a set of coordinates. But let's see. Let's continue, toggle the breakpoint, go back to start button, pull up reclass, and let's move around. Let's see. So they change when I move around, but when I move my camera, they also seem to be changing quite drastically, actually. So let's look all the way down. So 6191007. Let's see. 619 one zero zero seven right yeah one zero zero seven so this seems like it's very close to my actual head position okay what if you look all the way up then what so the second value changes a lot but the first value stays mostly the same what this tells me is that maybe this is where i'm actually looking where that actual ray is intersecting the actual map right we can actually test this so we can look in this direction take this value and actually paste it as a Z coordinate and see what happens. Oh, sorry, pause writable, not position. So we moved, interesting. What if I take seven to nine and paste it as the X coordinate? So we move inside the map. This tells me that this value right here is probably the coordinate, the X and the Z coordinate of where my actual ray is intersecting the map. So this is a very good sign. We can go back to Ida and rename this to probably intersecting position. Intersecting pose. And if I go back down here, so this is probably the X. So I'm going to call it intersecting pause X. And this is probably the Z. So I'm going to call this intersecting pose Z. And these are just copies, right? Yeah, so I'm going to rename them to intersecting pose x copy and intersecting xz copy. 
So everything in this function is actually cleared up. So I'm going to call this distance. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily answer our initial question. Where is the actual ray being drawn? Let's see, are there any function calls here? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to take this function, take the address of its call, rather, go back to Cheer Engine, and jump this address. So, sorry about Raycube. Let's actually rename this to Raycube. Let's rename as much as we can. Raycube. So, we've renamed a lot and it doesn't seem like we're finding the answer exactly. So, there's this offset, right? There's create rays, there's shot effects, there's Raycube. Any of these could actually be the function responsible for creating the ray. So, we have two things that we can do. We can either go inside every single one of these functions and see what they do. Or we can approach it in a way that we modify this value at the very start of this function, meaning we hook this function and modify this and see what happens. If something bad happens or it doesn't work, we can start looking into every single one of these functions. So just to recap everything we've done so far, we found that this value points to wherever your crosshair is intersecting, or rather, where the ray coming from your crosshair is intersecting. So that means that if we modify this to point, or rather to start, inside an enemy and end inside an enemy, we get a collision without having to move our actual camera around. With all that being said, we can actually go to Visual Studio and start coding this up. So I've gone ahead and set up a new DLL project in Visual Studio with minhook with these settings. Just make sure you have it on C++17. If you don't know how to set up minhook, we have an excellent article on how to set it up and it's going to be linked in the article in the description. Now I'm going to go ahead and create a new header file called sarbrayton.h. This is where everything we've reversed in reclass is going to go, plus the offsets we're going to be using. Now that we've moved the entity class and the entity list from reclass, we can go ahead and declare our offsets exactly like how we did it in the aimbot for beginners video. Now that that's done, I'm going to forward declare a new function called init, and I'm going to create a new file called sorbrayton.cpp. This is where the implementation for the init function is going to go. Now we can start implementing the init function. We are basically going to do what Cheat Engine does and add our offsets to the module base address. I'm going to grab the offsets from CE and comment them here so we don't have to go back and forth constantly. But before doing anything with the offsets, we obviously need the module base address first. Now we can go ahead and initialize the variables with our offsets. Now that we're done with that, let's go back to our main and add a call to the init function. Make sure to actually include the header file and that's it. Now we have to initialize midhook. It's super simple, we can just call minhook initialize in an if statement and we're done. And then we actually have to create the hook using create hook. This function needs three arguments. The address of the function we're hooking, the address of the function we're hooking it to, or in other words, our hook, and the address of the pointer to the original function. So first of all, how do we find the address of the function we're hooking? Well, we need to find its RVA by subtracting the module base address from the address of the function. Now, where can we find the address of the function? Well, we can simply go to IDA and find it in its disassembly view and we can copy it over. After that, we can go back to Cheat Engine and find the module base address by navigating to memory view, tools, and dissect PE headers. Once that's done, if we carry out the subtraction, we get 0x CP7F0 as the RVA of the function. So now I'm going to introduce a new file called aimbot.h. We're going to need three things here, the function's prototype for the function we're hooking, the original function pointer, and the hook function's forward declaration as well. We can get the function prototype directly from Ida. But before we actually type the fit in our code, we can make some changes to the function prototype. We can change the return address to void due to our use case, and we can change the types of the first and the second arguments to entity and vec3 pointers respectively. This is because we know that they are pointers from reversing the game earlier into the video. And now we can make the original function pointer. Just make sure to mark it as inline so we don't run into any issues with multiple definitions. And finally, we can write the forward declaration for the hook function, which we're going to implement later on in another source file. Now, I'm going to introduce the aimbot.cpp source file. This is where the implementation for the hook function is going to go, as well as the logic behind the aimbot itself. Most of the logic is explained in the aimbot for beginners video. So if you're confused about anything, you should go back and watch that video. So, here we have our calc angle and get this target functions, and they are almost identical to the previous aimbot video. The only thing that's different is the isEnemy function. Here we are using the name of the team of each entity to determine if they are an enemy or not. This also works in free for all since our team name is good and everyone else has an empty team name. Now we can move on to implementing the actual hook. What we're doing is very simple. First, we check if the past an entity is a local player pointer, and if it is, we get the closest target to the crosshair. 
Then we set the intersecting position of the ray we talked about earlier in the video to be inside the entity. Then we modify our position to also be inside the entity with a slight offset. This is because our broad end doesn't expect two entities to be inside the same position and it can cause some issues. Then we call the original function with our modified argument and that's it. Now we can go back to our main function and complete the call to create hook. Make sure to actually include the header file and we can go ahead and pass in the original function pointer as an LP void pointer. We also need to call enable hook to actually enable the hook. Now we need to make sure we actually disable the hook and an initialize min hook when we're done. We can then go ahead and build the project and inject into the game. So I have star button open in the game with a single bot, which means we can go ahead and see if the aimbot works. And yeah, as you can see, it's working perfectly and we're constantly killing the bot. And yeah, that's it.